And welcome to another episode of Hiroyuki Tarada, Diaries of a Master Sushi Chef. hiro san how are you? Hi. Very good afternoon, everyone. I know you feel like a kid in a candy store. <laughs> we are a knife merchant with yes. the owner, Dave. Hello. Hi, Dave. Thanks good so much for uh, having us here again. Well, it's good, good for you guys to come down. I appreciate you taking a long drive down from L.A. to see us. So I know that's not easy with traffic today. So Yeah, yeah. And it was well worth it. <laughs> Uh, as you know, David carries so many different brands of knives, and he's got a full warehouse stocked. So if you guys are looking for the best quality knives, whether you're a professional or home chef, definitely look at uh, knifemerchant.com. Check it out. I appreciate that. Yep, absolutely. Now, David, uh, you know, every year we come, we look forward to coming to see you because all of our viewers really love the wealth of knowledge that you provide. And so well, I appreciate the way you that. Speak, and I get uh, yeah. emails and stuff from them and phone calls. I'm, I'm happy to talk to them and, and answer. Okay. So, All right, excellent. So what are we talking about today? <laughs> That's well, we had been working with the Manana Kuni project, which was something where we're trying to get the master and apprentices uh, to stay together uh, by being able to market their knives directly so that they don't have to fool around with trying to learn websites or spending a week off going to the market and selling their knives and kiosks and things like that. It's been very successful for us with the uh, standard lines we have of uh, an SK-5, a white steel, and a blue steel, sold as Ume, Take, and Matsu. Um, Hiro owns one of each and is very familiar with them. Uh, recently, though, we have added a couple of additional lines. One of them is Jin San 3, which is exciting for me. It's a stainless steel that they have been able to manufacture in a way that it tempers at the same temperature range as the carbon steels meaning that they can sell uh, a little ingot of this steel and they can manufacture them in the old coal-fired stoves, hammer them and forge them uh, the same way that they do any of the other knives and have them uh, come out as a stainless steel product. Um, there are some other gin sands on the market. Uh, they call them silver paper. They're getting to be quite popular, more so in the United States than in Japan, actually. Uh, in the United States, we uh, have more people are saying, look, I just do not want to fool with rust prevention and things like that. When I first got one and they were showing to me, I thought there was a translation error because I would look at it and I can see that it's manufactured in the same style as a carbon steel. And I had to come home and start using it and said, oh my God, this is stainless steel. And then come back and talk uh, to the master and say, yes, we would love for you to develop a line of these for us. Um, and this is uh, an example of what they've done here. In addition to this being a stainless steel, the handle on this one is chestnut, which is different than what we sell uh, on our other knife lines. Uh, this right here is uh, buffalo horn, but they have also fired the chestnut handle. In Japan, there are a lot of uh, ancient buildings that were uh, built out of wood, and they have similar problems that we do with uh, termites and things like that, but they had developed a technique of burning the lumber to a up to a quarter, sometimes even a half inch deep, which left no food value, so the bugs were no longer interested in it. So it's kind of a throwback to that. They have wood-fired this chestnut, and that's what gives it that appearance. Each one is kind of a little bit unique depending on how much they licked it with the flame. These are beautiful and up close and personal with them. Really nice. They cut, uh, the price point on these, they come out about the same price as uh, the blue steel. Uh, okay. The hardness of the steel is more comparable to a number one, number two white. Uh, which is actually a range that I like. I like something that is kind of easy to sharpen but has very good edge retention. Uh, blue steel is, uh, it holds an edge for a very long time. As long as you're gentle and you use it correctly and don't get little micro pitting and micro chips. I tend to use my Yanagi because I'm not a sushi chef. Uh, so I use it for things that I shouldn't just because I really like the nice clean cuts that it gives. So I'll be dicing product and after a month or something, I'll look and say, you know, there's a couple of micro pits that now need to be ground out. It's more prevalent with the blue steel than it would be with the white or the ginseng. So I really like these knives. And we also ran across a master EY who does uh, a lot of work with Damascus. Uh, and he has added a new line of knives, Sakura, uh, for cherry blossom, for cherry tree, beautiful Damascus patterning that is over uh, number two blue steel. Gorgeous, yeah. And this is the backside of a Kamagata Usuba. So shiny, I'm getting the reflection of that duct up on top. Yes. <laughs> Let me try this knives right are some of the most difficult things to photograph. 
So this is his latest creation, David, you said? Yes. Yeah, this Damascus knife is absolutely gorgeous. And this is true Damascus, made in the old-fashioned way, where you're hammering and folding layers of steel together to give that patterning. Okay. Um, and we're using the Damascus patterning on the soft side of the steel and the blue on the blade steel, which is my preference. The pure Damascus knife, which I happen to have one here also, in a Western style, it actually, with all that Damascus patterning, what you have is a couple of different uh, types of iron that abrade at little different rates. So it's not really the best for sushi because we want absolutely the cleanest cut that we can get. And having one steel come off a little toothier than the other or having them at two different rare wear rates is not ideal for trying to make uh, the ultimate thin slice or really the ultimate uh, slice in which you're not rupturing any of the cells and having any oil run out of the product or uh, sap running out of celery juice, I guess, not sap. But that is kind of the idea of Japanese cooking, is to preserve the integrity of the food, uh, natural ingredients that are served in season and properly prepared and, and preferably cut in shapes that represent the initial product. Uh, these are things that are all very important in Japanese cuisine, served on seasonal plates. Uh, so when we're trying to bring these sushi knives, I, I think it's important to understand that these are the thinnest edge that you can get on a knife. They'll make the cleanest cuts, but they can also be delicate and they need to be used properly. Uh, we have been selling a lot of them. Uh, some of them go to sushi chefs, but even uh, premier sushi chefs have made mistakes with their first knives and sharpening. So I wanted to take a, a brief segment here to try and show the proper maintenance of these knives. Uh, occasionally I will sell a Yanagi to somebody and they will purchase a honing rod with it, which uh, prompts me to make a phone call immediately and say, <laughs> you weren't intending to use the honing rod on this knife, were you? Because uh, that will ruin the backside of the knife. They have to be sharpened on stones. Mm -hmm. What I have here is an example of a knife that will have to be fixed, and we're just getting in some cloud cover, but you see that it's very flat in a lot of these sections. This is what we call the ura on a knife. Here's an example of them when they're new. It's shiny just where this has touched the stone, along the spine, uh, kind of extensive amount on the tip, and then just along the blade, uh, along the very edge. Okay. Now this can be extended a little bit to make it a stronger. We can bring the Ura up to say an eighth of an inch or so, but you don't really want to go beyond that. And once your initial Ura is set, you don't need to come back onto these things with a coarse stone. Uh, the fine stone is all that you're going to need on the back side of these knives. So the sharpening of a traditional Japanese knife is very easy, but it's also very technical. So I just wanted to go over a couple of the technical aspects to make sure uh, that our customers are doing this properly. Okay. If we're starting with the coarser stone, this one right here is 1000 grit. That's the one I'm going to try and use here. Okay. This is a side where we do the vast majority of our sharpening. And this big, long, flat section is called the Shinogi line. And it has this line of demarcation up here that comes, you know, is the end of the Shinogi line and the beginning of the flat spot of the blade. As we remove metal from here, we want to keep this length the same. So when we sharpen, it's in two steps. First is a little bit to move the Shinogi line up and then we concentrate on the edge work. So that is accomplished really just by the placement of your fingers. When you're putting these onto the stone, the grip should be with the finger down here and the thumb towards the heel of the knife to apply appropriate pressure. Uh, it's not going to be as important when we are trying to crisp up this portion of the Shinogi line as it is when we're trying to do the edge. But for the first part, when we're trying to we're actually trying to move this shinogi line upward on the knife. So we concentrate by putting our fingers right up on the shinogi line and literally trying to move that up as we sharpen. And I'll talk about stones a little bit later also, but this slurry that is being released from the stone, um, I hear sometimes people doing videos and saying, oh, look at all the metal that's coming off of the knife and saying, well, this is the aluminum oxide that is being released from the stone you can have and you will have some metal fragments in it, but not anywhere near the quantity that you're seeing. This slurry needs to be left on. That's, I have seen people uh, constantly rinsing the stone. Uh, you're kind of defeating your purpose. The pressure on this is very, very light. 
This knife was recently oiled too, so my fingers are slipping on it a bit. But all that I'm trying to do right now is concentrate on making a nice, crisp shoulder for that Shinogi line. This down here is the thickest part of the knife, so we tend to put more emphasis on the heel section. And once we have this portion of the knife worked on, then we can concentrate a little bit on the edge. Okay. This one has a, a kind of steep micro bevel, which we will be removing and then putting back on. A micro bevel is okay as long as it's uh, the amount of micro bevel and at the angle in which you want it to be. So after working first on the Shinogi line, I will then come down. Now here's where having the thumb down here really helps you because you can give a little bit of a twist and apply pressure and you just want to understand what you're trying to do at this point I'm trying to put pressure directly on the edge so I'll move my fingers down a little bit we have to first start with the tip and you can elevate the handle just a little bit here to make sure we're making full contact with the tip but then as we start progressing just slide your fingers down and it does not take much pressure, but I'm twisting this into the stone a little bit with the thumb. And this makes sure that I have nice clean contact with the edge. Now I just picked a random knife off a shelf that somebody had sent in for uh, complete refurbishing and rehandling. So I'm not going to bore everybody with the entire amount of time that it takes to completely freshen this knife. But the point that I want to make here now is as you're starting to develop a little bit of burring on the back side, I'm not going to touch that 1000 grit stone. That's how we got into trouble on this one in the first place. And when I say trouble, what I mean is these knives are designed with that concave backside for a very specific reason. It allows the knife to curl so that the very edge makes contact with the stone and uh, we can get the ultimate sharpness on there and once this becomes flat uh, the food does not peel away from it correctly and we can no longer get uh, as superior an edge on here as we're not bringing out full capabilities of the knife anymore so if I finish with the 1000 grit and I want to touch it up a little bit more for the sake of feeling the burring again on the next stone then we'll come to the back side now when we do the back side of the knife it's very important that we go dead flat we can't be angling off like this uh, a number of reasons why, but the most important is this knife is thinner here than it is here. And it tends to gouge at this section of the knife. So when we're working on that backside, it's very simple, but light pressure pushing it into the stone. And particularly when you get into longer knives, don't be putting your hands on either side because if you lean the knife just slightly and put a little too much pressure, you can really gouge and catch a corner. So try and keep this hand directly over the top of the stone as we're doing this uraoshi sharpening. And so this would be for simple burr removal. And then we'd come back and do our progression. When we get into high grit stones, 8,000, 10,000, and 20,000 grit stones, that's for these, for the Japanese knives. We can really get some great polish on the Shinogi line. Not really so important on Western knives. I mean, a 20,000 grit stone on a Western knife is just silly, mm -hmm. but it does a really nice job of putting a mirror polish on these things. Uh, what I had done here was a uh, 1,000 grit ceramic. And here we're moving to a 3,000. And again, I'm just working edge on this one. And we will do complete knife sharpening videos. The main takeaway that I want for our customers to know from this is that if you have bought one of these knives, don't grind out that backside of the knife. Almost anything else you do to it, I can fix it, I can sharpen it, we can do a lot of things to it. You can sharpen it yourself quite easily, but understand that the backside of that knife is delicate and uh, needs to be treated on only the higher grit stones. Now to get these things truly polished, it's just time. 
Now, as far as micro beveling goes, there's nothing wrong with having a micro bevel on a knife. It makes the edge stronger. So depending on how good you are as a chef, the quality of your cutting board and exactly what you're using it for, you may want to micro bevel anywhere from just a couple of degrees to all the way up here at 25 and 30 degrees. Some people are very excessive about it. And uh, it's very simple. You're just dragging that knife straight across the stone and putting kind of a steep micro bevel on it. That'll put a very strong edge on and help to eliminate chipping. Um, but you want this to be, the micro beveling to be no thicker than a human hair. Mm, okay. So just a very fine micro bevel that we can grind out the next time that we're sharpening. And it, that is being done on an 8,000 grit stone here. Generally when I'm sharpening a knife, I will go through, I will start on a, uh, like a 400 grit and progress through 400, 1,000, 3,000. Um, and then when it get to the 8,000 grit and we're polishing, I'll put a micro bevel on it at 8,000, knock the burr off and do it a second time at 12,000. Uh, just kind of a personal preference, but uh, definitely not on the coarser stones. Okay. It's a uh, you know, very delicate edge and you're spinning it up here. It doesn't take much to put a little tiny bevel on that. Now that's what so. this knife is treatment's gonna get? Yes. Okay. Yeah, well this one, I'm going to send it out to have the handle completely redone. This was actually a sentimental piece. This was the first knife of uh, a very famous sushi chef um, who was, you know, sending them to me to take care of and do the rehandling. And he was kind of funny. He was like, don't look at my first knife. I have a series <laughs> of four knives that he's used over the years. Okay. And at this point in time, there's technically nothing wrong with this handle. It's dirty, uh, but it's not broken. Um, so we have guys here in the U.S. who would do that. But nonetheless, I'm saying it back to our guys in Minanakuni in Japan. It's like, ah, they're the experts. Okay. Um, besides, I've never taken one of these off intentionally. When we're rehandling, it's usually because the handle has come loose. This one is, it's on there. It's yeah, a Kikoichi, yeah. so it's not going to come off easily. Sure. So, Very nice. but it will be fun. Now, <clears throat> this is a little uh, tool also. This is a very well-worn and well-soaked stone. But one thing I want to say about these uh, 8,000 grit stones, this is what they call a nagura or a fixer. When we're trying to put a polished edge on, these things are for raising that slurry. Just to get it going because the knife alone can't start it. Yeah, and it takes so many strokes. Mm -hmm. And if you are trying to sharpen, the idea is to hold that angle and to not spend an excessive amount of time on it. Uh, you know, true. usually for a lot of people, it's like, okay, they're good for 30 strokes. You start getting 40 and 50, they start to wobble. Yeah. So speaking of which, I'd like to go over some tips on sharpening a knife. I think there are a lot of knife sharpening videos out there. And I think a lot of times they make it harder than it should be. I think everyone should be very comfortable picking up a stone and sharpening a knife. It is not that difficult to do, but there are a few basics that I think people should understand. First is the physical geometry of this being a ball socket joint. So if you are trying to sharpen a knife that is down here at waist high, the tendency for your arms is going to be to sweep in this motion very hard to keep a steady angle. So to keep that steady angle, you're trying to compensate by you know, sweep, moving your shoulders forward and rolling them. However, if you can get your sharpening surface up here at the sternum, you can get a nice straight angle. Right. That's why if you look at the Japanese masters, a lot of them are sitting down when they're sharpening and they can get this right up high. And that helps to allow you to just use the elbows and eliminate the shoulder from the process. So <clears throat> we have a sharpening table over there is built considerably higher so this is still a little bit uh, smaller than what I would like but the very basic techniques are this first of all have the stone at the right height secondly we hold the knife in a particular way and the reasons why are what I want people to understand everybody can develop their own te techniques for knife sharpening but if you understand why we're doing it this way then you will understand why you're making a change, as long as you can accommodate the same uh, function. The functionality between putting a finger down here and putting a thumb down here is to try and lock this wrist. This is the hand that we do all of our writing with and that wrist likes to twist and turn. So if you can lock it in here like this and put pressure on the heel, it really helps you to keep a nice straight edge. Secondly, don't push. Where you place your fingers are important. If you put your fingers up here and you start pushing, well, you're fighting yourself. You're trying to hold this edge and then you're applying pressure up against the stone. And it really does not need much stone. 
uh, much pressure. The stone should do all the work for you. So I start at the tip, personal preference on starting with the tip. Just put uh, two fingers right down as close to the edge as you can get and try and work the middle of the stone as opposed to, you know, all the other people are doing them in long cuts and doing these kinds of things back and forth. Just work one side until you are able to feel a uh, burr. And just gradually move your fingers down. And as we get in here, we can even do three fingers on the blade. Now this one right here is a ceramic stone, which are great at polishing. They're really slow to release slurry in these 1000 grit stages. We've been looking at some stones that are made here in the US uh, between here and myself that I think people are going to like because they bite quick and they're well done. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit about what makes a good stone and why they're so darn difficult to buy as far as knowing what's a good one and what is not. But we just continue working these things until we have a nice even burr. The burring is going to be felt on the backside, but let me wipe this down so we can see what kind of an edge we're getting. So we can see that. Mm, I think we got that, yep. Wow. Yeah, we can see that at home, looks great. And this is our coarsest stone. Almost all of your work is done with the coarse stone. The others then are just uh, removing any of the leftover grind marks from the initial coarser stone. But once we have that burr, then we flip it over. This is the second thing I do. I put it in my left hand okay. and do the exact same thing. Okay. Now I know a lot of people are saying, oh my God, I could never put it in my left hand. But I tell you, if you try it, it's awkward at first when you're like trying to throw a softball, you're like, I don't even know which foot to put forward <laughs> and things like that. And it feels really weird. And I think the tendency will be, you, know, you still have the finger here, still have the thumb on the heel. I think the tendency at first will be to take little tiny short strokes because it just feels so darn awkward to them. But after it starts becoming comfortable, you just gradually make nice long strokes, trying to work towards the center of the stone. And the more that you can work this direction parallel with the stone, the less you have to worry about cutting into the stone. And you know some of the other techniques, you put pressure on the push stroke and release on the right. pull and things like that. Well, we do this here uh, for people, meaning that I sharpen knives for a living. I don't have the time to put pressure one side and then release and things like that. It's like, look, we want this done. So you in, don't uh, pull, pushing and pulling. Correct. Yeah, okay. when you're in this direction, we're not going to cut the stone. Sure. It's when we start squaring up like this, it will start to shave that stone. So with this same technique, we are sharpening the backside. And of course, this will just push the burr back to the other side. Uh, and then when we're done, before I go to another stone, I don't keep changing hands. When I uh, finish off a knife, I'll just go from tip to heel, from heel to the tip. You should stop right here, make sure that tip doesn't slide all the way off the edge of the stone, which can round it slightly. So just a couple of strokes back and forth to finish that off. And then we can move on to our polishing stone. For the most part, a 1,000, 6,000 grit is fine. Uh, 1,000, 8,000, that's all that you need. This, the second section of this process is really just going to be for polishing out that bevel that we established. This happens to be a one-sided knife, but mm -hmm. although they call it a one-sided knife, it isn't. the only true one-sided knives are like the Manana Kuni line, the traditional Japanese. These have to have uh, a little bit of a back bevel. So going to the 8,000 grit, everything kind of remains the same. If you are unsure at what angle you had left off with, you better be a little bit higher uh, which would put like a secondary bevel on it. The angles are not so specific. I was very surprised when I went to Japan and was learning to sharpen and the uh, master kept saying, find your angle. You know, I'm asking him which angle he's recommending for the knife he made. And it took me a while to understand what he's getting at. It's like the point is, um, 
get an angle that you can reproduce and don't sit there and worry about is that 18 degrees is okay. it 22 degrees if my angle is too high what's going to happen is that there's a little bit more wedging when i'm cutting through carrots and i might just look at it and say hey i don't like the performance it will still be sharp the next time you can come down just sharpen it a little bit lower okay so no big deal yeah and people talk about what degrees should you be sharpening at i mean even we even if we told you be hard to really measure you know it is really hard to get very specific on yeah. these things um, there are little wedges that I had used at the beginning uh, that I still do I'll create paper wedges just so that I have an idea of what's 15 what's 18 what's 22 uh, and beyond that it, it becomes pretty advanced sharpening if we're if I'm putting a knife at 10 degrees it's because that knife is up in the very thick part of the knife and I'm going to be laying uh, two or maybe even three bevels on it to try and salvage a very, very used knife. And then the backside, same technique. And again, my goal here is not to, today, to do a whole lot about sharpening knife. I just want certain takeaways. I want them to remember, bring this up to a height to where you can work it straight forward with your elbows. Secondarily, find a method that locks the wrist so that you can control that angle. And thirdly, do the exact same thing on both sides of the knife. When people are flipping a knife over and trying to put a hand up here and stuff, your hand's in the way of your work. You can't really see what you're doing well as far as trying to hold that angle. Um, and it's just awkward. For chefs out there, I just remind you how awkward it was the first time you started cooking, started trying to put this hand down and do this claw grip. It took a couple of weeks before you're comfortable with it. It won't take a couple of weeks to do this. By the third time you're sharpening a knife, the left hand will be quite easy. Okay. So if absolutely necessary, start using a toothbrush with your left hand. <laughs> <laughs> so good point. But that's what we have there. Now I wanted to talk about, I had alluded to the fact that buying stones are extremely difficult. And the reason being, nobody gives us enough information to work with. When I'm trying to buy stones to sell to the customers out here, I will ask questions about what's the bonding agent that you're using on here? And the response I get, well, that's proprietary. It's like, okay, so if you're not gonna tell me what bonding agent you're using, and you're not going to tell me the quantity or type of aggregate that you're putting into these stones, they may tell me the type. They will, may say aluminum oxide. There's like seven different types of aluminum oxide, mm -hmm. including vitrified aluminum oxide, which is something that they have superheated and basically turned it into glass and put back into a stone. Um, so the net result is everything is anecdotal. You'll see a lot of people online, well, I like uh, Shapton, I like the Naniwa, I like these stones. And unfortunately, that's really the only information that we have to work with is what have you tried and what have you used and what's worked well. Um, the new line that uh, we are working on, uh, an American-made product, I have been using for about a month now, and I still won't even get into who it is or what we're doing because in a month's time, I have used uh, you know a little bit of the stone, but when we are into the middle of the stone and I see that they cut consistently all the way through and things like that, then we'll start recommending. Generally, uh, it's five to six month period of test uh, on our products before we let them go live. but. I'm very excited about these. I think they have worked extremely well. Uh, and I have done a number of uh, classes with the Art Institute and different uh, schools where I have, you, you come out there, in this case, I'm literally trying to sharpen their knives to get them to a, a fine, perfect edge and show off what we can do as opposed to this little short course. Um, so to me, it was taking a chance coming out here with these unknown stones. But they work well. Uh, this is an oil stone. Um, generally silicone carbide is what they use. Uh, this is Norton. Uh, the problem with oil stones is that they tend to clog. Uh, you can use water or oil with them. They work better with oil, but over a period of time um, they start filling with uh, metal pieces and things like that. And uh, <clears throat> they still have their place though. If you're on one of the fishing boats here in San Diego, they cannot have this kind of slop and mess coming around while they're trying to sharpen knives. They generally have one of these floating in the bait tank, and that's what they'll pick up and sharpen their knives with. Uh, even at poultry processing plants, they will still use these old-fashioned uh, silicone carbides. The advantage to them is it's a much harder uh, bonding agent, so they don't need flattening all the time. Uh, they tend to stay nice and flat. 
disadvantage is more of an inconsistent cut and more of a coarse cut. Um, these things aren't sold in 1,000, 3,000, 5,000. They're sold as you know, coarse, medium, fine. Um, and that's just not specific enough for what we're trying to do. Okay. Now, when they say 1,000 grit, what they're talking about is you have a screen with a mesh size of uh, 1,500 uh, whatever per uh, 12 inches, and you can sieve uh, the uh, aluminum oxide crystals through there catch it on a second screen so everything larger than that was held up top anything smaller than that fell through and then we can have a very specific uh, aggregate size that we put into a stone now comes the mystery saying okay what did you bond that stone with because some of them break down very quickly and easily um, and then how much of it did you put in uh, because in some of the ceramics I, I like them quite a bit for their polishing effect but they don't cut very well. And I think the reason being on the coarser stones of 1000 grit, 600 and uh, even up to 3000 grit, they just don't have as much aggregate as the traditional water stones. So I like them because they're cleaner, they're easier to come out. You just squirt them with a little water and you're good to go. But I would drop down a size. So if I am wanting a 1000 grit water stone uh, and was looking at a Naniwa, well, I'd pick up an 800 to get the same cutting effect as a traditional 1000 grit. So. I imagine that's all clear as mud right now. <laughs> uh, but again, the uh, fixer stone, this is important on these higher grits. When we get to 8,000 and 12,000, uh, I had one customer comment, it's like, oh, it does the same thing as my 1,000 grit stone. I think it's because it's the red color. And if I were to use this on a coarser stone, um, I will start wearing down the fixer stone. It's not really showing up as well here. It does on a, a white stone, you'll see that I'm leaving red slurry on there. It's not really designed for those. It is designed for 5,000 grit and above. Those stones where you'd be taking your first 30 strokes just trying to get a slurry going, it's much better to get it started with a little fixer stone. Okay. And they're cheap, they're like eight bucks. Unless you buy Bob Kramer brand, then I think they're 30 mm. for the same okay. thing. <laughs> There are also, of the full gamut of stones, you would have diamonds. Diamonds are good for fixing edges. When I have a, an edge that is uh, chipped and screwed up, I can take a knife and I can go absolutely perpendicular to the stone and grind out the pitting first. Um, downside to them, when you're looking at really fine uh, edged knives and I start getting close to the edge, it starts pulling out a little bit too much of the metal pieces. So I don't get a good finished edge on diamond. I use them for my course. Even the, the fine stone, uh, I will be using them on my rough work and then continue over to other stones. This one right here is a Norton. It's designed to fit into that big old black uh, IM313 machine. And he's like 150 bucks. So they're hugely expensive. I have to have them, but uh, other people don't. More common, they sell these things with a honeycomb pattern. It's called an interrupted diamond stone. And you know, the, the downside, they, they say, well, the metal particles will get trapped into the holes. The reality is you've got about 40% of that thing covered with diamonds. Uh, the rest of it is holes. So it saves them a lot of money making it. For our purposes, I need something that's going to last. So that's why we spend the big money going with the Nortons. Mm -hmm. This is a natural stone. This one right here is a combination. They come from Arkansas. So this, having been done mined from work from the earth, <clears throat> this is what they would call soft Arkansas stone. Um, the harder they are, the smoother. So they have soft Arkansas, hard Arkansas, surgical black Arkansas, which is this one, extremely smooth. And if you can find it, there's even a translucent, which tends to break when they're dynamiting it. So there's not very much of the translucent that's available on the market. Um, so, you know, the surgical black is named for what it was. There was back in the day that we'd actually use these for surgical tools. They are extremely fine. They'll do a lot of polishing for you, but for my purposes, they don't cut fast enough to have any pragmatic value. Now, there are natural stones sold out of Japan that um, are kind of different. They will uh, have minerals that come out of them. They're, they're softer. They will abrade, they will create their own slurries, and they do a nice job of polishing up that shinogi line. Uh, these are very hard. They are never going to wear down. Uh, you can just sharpen on that and hand it down to your grandkids. They'll still be <laughs> sharpening on it. You won't really see really? any swarfing. So, and you said just basically as a polishing. 
Yes. So it won't even take any. It's a polishing stone. And when I have used this, mm -hmm. I'll put like diamond paste on it and things like that. For my purpose, it works the same as a marble slab. I, okay. just, I just use it as a hard substrate. Got it. And lastly, I wanted to talk about uh, honing rods. Uh, a lot of people are using these, well, all of us should be using it for the Western style knives, but which one you choose can vary greatly. Um, we go everywhere from diamond, uh, which is this. Diamonds cut very fast. I think they leave a little bit of too coarse of an edge. So if you're using a diamond, I would suggest finishing it up with a ceramic. Um, <clears throat> because it is just too rough an edge for what I'm trying to do. This one right here is what they call a helical cut. Extremely coarse. I, I wish people could feel this. This one is uh, for really removing very rough burring. It's something we do in part of the knife making process or when we're repairing a knife, if you take a knife and cut it perpendicularly uh, along a grinding belt, you're gonna get burrs flan fanning it, mushrooms out to both sides with these uh, real ugly metal slivers. And this is just for knocking off that very coarse metal sliver. And it goes down to an extreme. This is a polishing rod. These are uh, also known as a butcher steel. And we sell a ton of these to the meat processing plants. Uh, now they're using this because they have very, very soft steel. Uh, they're using Victorinox or Dexter Russell knives that are made specifically for that industry. They'll be hardened from 54 to 56 Rockwell. And uh, the life expectancy on that knife is from a few months to maybe a year and a half. They want the steel soft because they can use it and burnish it and bring that edge back. They will have uh, meat coming down an assembly line process. You're not allowed to take a break and say, can you stop the line because my knives are dull? They're generally wearing a little scabbard that has anywhere from two to maybe four knives on it. Uh, so they have to be able to get that knife sharp on the fly. Um, <clears throat> ceramics, this one right here is a, a titanium coated steel from F. Dick. Uh, when you get into some of the super hard steels, when you're getting up to 67 Rockwell, you need to get something that is uh, seriously harder than that steel to hold the edge. The ones that I prefer, uh, this one right here is a multi iron, fairly smooth, but it has some grooving along the steel. I like the grooving because it's very responsive. When I run a knife along here, it tells me if I have any pieces sticking out, any uh, dips and valleys and hills and valleys, I should say, and I will feel it and direct my attention to whether I can fix it on this steel or if I need to go to a stone. This one was 104 bucks. Uh, when I was working in restaurants, I would have thought it unimaginable to spend that much on a honing rod. Uh, and we did not have a lot of good Japanese cutlery. Everything was German steel, it was fairly soft. And had I known then what I know now, uh, I could have had a heck of a lot easier time silver skinning uh, filet mignon and legs of veal and things like that. Mm -hmm. Those require a very crisp edge. So <clears throat> ceramics are my preference when you start getting at 61 Rockwell and above. When you're at a standard 59, 60 Rockwell, the edge can roll back and forth and uh, this is really designed to straighten that edge back up. When you start getting it 61 and higher, it never really seems to roll the edge, they just get dull on you. So ceramic is like using a 3000 grit stone, depending on how coarse your rod is. Uh, this is more of a sharpening process, so it takes a little more control in that you're paying attention to your angle, you're not just out here whipping a knife across it. Um, but they will do a good job. Let me grab a knife here and I'll talk about a couple of the techniques. So the ways that we use a honing rod, in its most basic form, this is designed to when the edge rolls over, to stand it back up again straight. Um, you can usually tell when your knife needs the honing if it is one of the softer steel types, because there's a little catch right there. And these occur most often because of the way that you're using it on the cutting board. If you are cutting your food and then sliding it across the cutting board like this, you roll your edge almost every time. If I can get people that when they're cutting along the cutting board, just lower the knife to this angle, move the food and bring it back up. This is pretty close to the angle to which your knife was sharpened. You can do that over and over again, you won't roll the edge. So number one thing about knife sharpening is try to not have to do it all the time. Uh, good wooden cutting board is nice to use. Uh, not the really hard, you don't want curly maple, but you want the soft maple, sugar maples. Uh, teak is a good wood, hinoki is good. Um, you have some synthetic cutting boards such as Hero would use. And, uh, but if you're using 
the nylon cutting boards are really kind of hard on a knife edge and things like that. So start with a good cutting board. Don't roll the edge when you're sharpening. And then the correct technique is most importantly here, I just want to make sure you get it all the way from the heel down to the tip. If you have the honing rod standing up in this angle, you can see the, you can see the angle that you're doing from both sides. And it's two firms to either side and then one just very light to make sure you don't keep pushing that edge back and forth. And that burring that we had down there is now gone. And that's all it takes for these things. Now, <coughs> people are using a diamond when that edge really starts to get dull. And if you're using a diamond, this is very different. Now you have to be very specific about the angle. It's, it's not going to make much of a difference whether you go in this direction or this direction, but uh, this is what we call I give up. <laughs> this is a trailing edge and this is leading edge is what I'm trying to get at. Uh, leading edge cuts a little faster than trailing edge, but this very quickly uh, cuts an edge on a knife. Uh, I would need to do a little bit of a back bevel and then when I'm done it's like it's kind of sharp. It'll rip right through a tomato, but it will not do a good job for cutting through meats. Mm. Uh, it's going to tear at them. Because it's too rough. Correct. Okay. Uh, so if you finish up with a ceramic rod, uh, you'll be in much better shape. So people generally would have two rods. Correct. Uh, they, like should. Stones, they should. Uh, what I see okay. in restaurants a lot is just the diamond yeah, and yeah. they go back exactly. to work. But the worst thing is when they have a diamond and they start right here and they start sharpening. Then when they bring it to me, I have this little reverse curve. Now I have to grind everything from in front of that to try and get their knife to function again so that it'll go through chives and, and green onions and stuff without making slinkies. So whatever <laughs> steel that you use, make sure that you go all the way from the heel to the tip. Okay. Now, with now what's the, the right way? I saw you holding it with a top down, like upwards. Yes. Technically, this is the way that we would teach for the best results. And the reason being that you can see what's going on. And Pragmatically, it's safe too. Sorry, Dave. it is safe. Yeah. As long as this is sitting on a terry cloth towel or something like that. If you're on a stainless steel table and that tip's wiggling around, then we pick it up and go like this. Now, this knife is fairly flat, so it's okay to swing out like this, but if you have a butcher's knife or something with a curl, it becomes very awkward to try and curl around like this to get the full shape of the knife. So that's why we start going inward. For the okay. purpose of standing an edge back up straight, it doesn't really matter. But in the restaurants, we're always going to want you curling inward like this because it's just not safe to be doing anything like this and having a knife edge flying around. Yeah. If you're going to cut somebody, we consider it polite that you cut yourself. <laughs> so, so that's why we go inward okay. like this. But aside from just the normal stroke back and forth techniques, these can be used as they do in a butcher shop when the knife starts getting dull. You can put a little pressure and you can actually get some work hardening done on that edge. And this is just kind of like using a stone where you're working one edge and then the other and you will still have to finish it up with a couple of strokes. But that's what they're doing with that butcher's rod when they're getting into uh, meat processing and poultry processing plants. Um, the quality of a steel really depends on how crisply they were able to cut the shoulders uh, on these lines. Now, these don't all have lines. This is F. Dick. F. Dick is what you should buy. There's a bunch of different brands. If you're buying a Wusthof or Henkel and, and things like this, they don't really even make their own steels. Most of the time they buy them from Fluger. They know that they need to have one in the set, but it's not really their area of expertise. They make knives. So F. Dick, this is the best manufacturer. And on this one, you can see it's just a series of S's uh, running up and down the knife. When you have uh, just lines going up and down, those can be imparted onto the edge of the knife. With this one, it's really hard to get any kind of an imprint that damages that edge. This one right here, I spent $63 for. Uh, shortly thereafter, uh, they sent me a Euro cut. They have them in two styles in oval. It's like $32. The difference is the quality of the handle. Mm -hmm. And I don't care about the handle. Right. Uh, so I, I would look at it if, uh, for your viewers who are saying, hey, what's the best bang for the buck on a very good quality honing rod? Any of the Euro cuts. A regular cut in F Dick is equivalent to a fine cut anywhere else. Okay. Uh, on the German steels, regular cut has a little more bite and does a better job. If you're using Japanese and German, I'd get the fine cut. My preference is the oval. Uh, it's just more contact with the knife edge, there's just more surface area. So it takes fewer strokes. 
And I, I would get 12 inches. It's not going to fit into your, hone, into your uh, knife block. And for the cooks, it doesn't really fit into one of the pockets on your bag. You just lay it lengthwise in there. But uh, if you had $150 to spend, I think you're better off uh, spending $80 on a good honing rod and $70 on the knife than spending uh, $130 on the knife and $20 on a honing rod. Uh, because <clears throat> now F-Duck F -Duck doesn't make any junk. But other manufacturers, when you get it, you just run your fingers down it. You can feel all these slivers of metal that are coming loose. Uh, so if you're trying to get a cheap one, you're better off buying one used from somebody else where they have already knocked all the rough edges off of it with their knife so you don't have to do so with yours. Um, but yeah, multiple ways that you can use a honing rod. Don't need to be locked into thinking it's back and forth and back and forth. If your knife is dull, I have steak knives. Steak knives are constantly going up against porcelain plates. Mm -hmm. um, I don't want to sharpen those things all the time on stones. But with this thing, I can come up with the steak knives and I just run them back and forth. You can get a very good edge on a standard Wusthof steak knife. So, yeah, good point. When's the last time anyone at home sharpened their steak knives with a rod, right? Yeah. Or a stone. I have. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and, and they're difficult because they're thin, so it's hard mm -hmm. to control an angle on a really thin knife, and they have a big uh, curve at the tip, so much better way to right. go. But I think that's it. So, you know, big goal here is try not to have your knives go dull by uh, using some good techniques and using a good cutting board. First line of defense is going to be a honing rod, and if you have a Japanese knife, for God's sake, don't touch them to one of these. Yeah. Um, that's just a completely different animal. <laughs> they need a stone. That's great. But thankfully, Knife Bridge can take care of your knife if there's a problem. So That's true. Happy to do so. <laughs> right. We'll leave David's information below. David, thank you so much for another wonderful couple episodes that you've really spent your time and effort in letting everyone know really what to do at home. My pleasure. And this can uh, be for everyone's advantage. So check out KnifeMerchant.com. No Heroes, kind of a big kid in a big candy store. <laughs> So many things they have to offer. Okay, thanks again so much, and we'll see you again very soon. I hope so. Thank Take you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.